So, um, thanks for the intro. I'm the co-founder of Quincy and McCade. Quincy and McCade together is the leader in microwave networks and microwave uh, transported data. And what we do is uh, essentially try to bring a level playing field to that speed race and speed arena. Today, I will not speak about what was advertised, which is a review of the microwave networks. I will try and tell you a story of what the data and good data can tell you. So I will take a sample of data, analyze it, and try to find interesting things in it. And thereby, I will try and convince you that if we have good and open data, we can actually change the way we regulate markets and improve transparency and trust in the markets. So who we are, and that's a little bit of the State of the Union address. It's something that we put up every time we go to a conference. And every time we go, there are fewer dotted lines and more solid lines. Because what we like to do is we like to build. We actually have people in the company that go up towers, install dishes, align dishes. We're a very brick and mortar company. We're actually designing, uh, you know, leasing, uh, everything. And all our networks belong to us except one. Out of this um, map here, we're riding on our networks everywhere to deliver market data, except the transatlantic part. And transatlantic, we are riding uh, with a partner. And we have a tier two service. So we're not on the best latency. And that's another thing that characterizes our company. We try to be as transparent as we can. And we put the Quincy data always on the fastest that we can procure or build. Usually we build, and when we procure, we try to see uh, what we can procure best. So Transatlantic was a little bit of an odd man there, because we rode on someone else's network. And we knew we were Tier 2, and we told our clients we were Tier 2. But we didn't know where Tier 1 was. So one of the motivations behind the talk today is how we tried to understand what tier one latency was. And we just looked for data that would tell us what tier one latency was. And of course, the other motivation is to tell you that if you look at the data right, you see a lot of things. And regulation could be improved that way. So what do we do as a business? You know, we love building. We keep reducing latency. We continually invest. It's a race. It's a race essentially between us and a little bit other vendors, but mostly us and our clients. Because our clients are the most advanced firms in this arena, and they, many of them build their own networks. And we're in a state of either we're a little faster or we're a little slower than them. And when we're faster, the fastest line is available to everyone. And we're, when we're slower, it's only available to the guy who is smart enough to build a better network. So we do have a role in the market, which actually changes a little bit the balance of the market itself. So what we do is we add more paths. We will have an announcement in maybe another continent sometime next year. And we constantly try to add more data and talk about transparency. So let me now go directly into the story. So there are news releases, and sometimes there are macro news releases. And those releases move the market. That's a very interesting fact, because you know the thing was released somewhere. And you know that from that somewhere, it was sent as fast as possible to the places where you need to use it. And then it was reverberated into many trades on every exchange. And it goes from, say, suppose it's the labor market thing. It goes from DC to the CME, from DC to NASDAQ, from DC to MAWA, from DC to Europe. 
So can we track that propagation? And from that tracking, can we infer the latency that it takes to go from one place to the other? And that's the question. So before I go in the question, I, I need to tell you a little bit about notation. So in this particular case, the news as we believe, and we'll check if that belief is, is actually consistent with the data, is released in DC. And, and this controversy about this, you don't always know exactly the way it's done. Now it's a bit better known, but uh, it used to be not even disclosed. So let's suppose it's released in one point in DC. So that's T0. And that T0 is around 1330 UTC, United uh, you know, Universal Time. So when I say it's around that number, it's because the government doesn't really care to be synchronized. So it, it's actually, there's a little bit of a, an error bar around this, and the error bar is of the order of one second, as we will see. So it's not very precise. Then it's released someplace, and it rushes to go to the markets where people need to use it to trade. So at T1, it arrives on a market, and the first market uh, that is relevant and big that it arrives to is NASDAQ. And that T1, then someone who's carried that data uh, to NASDAQ will need to use it and trade on NASDAQ. So they will have a uh, time between T1 and T2, which is a tick to trade time, where they will receive the data, do some FPGA wizardry, and send an order to NASDAQ. And that takes a very small time. So we don't know because uh, we don't know what the firms that do that exactly do. But let me say that it's under five microseconds, and you can talk to the uh, FPGA vendors, which will give you numbers that are way below this. But you need to take into account a few cabling and things. So that's of the order of five microseconds or less. Then the order arrives on the gateway at NASDAQ, and then it needs to be executed. And NASDAQ publishes some uh, statistics on how fast its trading engine will, will go and essentially publishes statistics around on the round trip time. And I think the numbers they publish are roughly it's 40 microseconds. And if you have questions about this, you have NASDAQ representatives here ready and willing to answer, I'm sure. So based on public sources, let's assume that half of that is the uh, T1 to uh, the T2 to T3 time, which is sending the data to matching the data. Then the exchanges will publish the data and it takes another time. But when they publish the data, they usually publish the time that they did the matching. And the good thing is the exchangers have matured and now they're synchronized and their synchronization is good to around a microsecond. Um, you know, maybe a little less, but you know, a microsecond is the order of magnitude of, the, of their precision. So that's very useful. When you look and analyze the data, you know to about one microsecond when a trade occurred. So what we need here, we don't know where T0 is, but we know it exists. Uh, we don't know what T1 is, but we can actually try and see what T3 is based on the market data. So we will look at T3 on different markets, and we will try and see what we can infer on T1 and then T0 and see if it's consistent with uh, the data being released in K Street and you know, what we can say about transatlantic eventually. So this is a plot of uh, trading activity on NASDAQ at that particular time, and that's on eSpeed. So one thing you have to wonder about is, how do I recognize a trade that was traded by a macro event? You know, you don't ask trading firms to record their thought process when they submit a trade. You don't know that it was triggered by a macro event. So how do you characterize this? 
Well, one easy way to do that is to remember that a macro event is a macro event. So what does macro mean? It means that it impacts many different equities, many different contracts at the same time. The same information is relevant for 10 different ETFs, for bonds, for futures on the CME. The same event will trigger one set of trades simultaneously. And usually trades don't occur simultaneously at the few microsecond level on an exchange. Usually one trade occurs on one underlier and then you wait for the, that to be published and the other houses that analyze the data react to it and trade on another one. So the trade synchronization, the simultaneity of the trades is to the 100 microsecond level, yes, maybe, but not to the few microsecond level. So let's see what we have on NASDAQ here. So we have this on eSpeed. So the last digits are 798. That's microseconds. Here you have the same signature. And you can see there are no trades before. And there's a lull before you have more trades. So this signature here is 796. So it's two microseconds away from the first one. So that is a definite signature of macro event. So this kind of analysis you can do on NASDAQ. NASDAQ publishes their timestamp to the nanosecond. They're probably, uh, if you ask them, they will probably tell you that it's accurate at least to the microsecond. Not sure that they will vouch for the nanosecond. So you can do the same thing on the CME. And on the CME, it actually triggers a, a much bigger flurry of uh, trades. And you can see you can very precisely also determine when that uh, macro news hit the CME. You do that on ICE. Uh, ICE doesn't publish to the microsecond, so it's, you know, you have one millisecond precision. It won't be very good for what we try to do here. It will be sub uh, millisecond precise. You can go to ICE Europe in Baseldin. And same thing, they only publish the millisecond. Not perfect for what we want to do. But then you go to Eurex, and Eurex is there again, microsecond precise. You have the signature over there, and there again, it's not as big as on the CME, but you can actually see a flurry of simultaneous trades and different instruments. That's the definite signature of a macro news. All right, so we have determined uh, time of arrivals. Not really time of arrivals, but like signature times on the exchanges. So let me summarize this for you. So on NASDAQ, we have this and I, you know, the many digits. Uh, the last three are less relevant, but they're relevant up to the 796. ICE won't be usable. CME is relevant to 270 which we rounded to 271. Life is not very relevant. Eurex is relevant. And you can see that Eurex has T2 there. So Eurex is very nice because it does provide you in the market data the time at which the order that triggered the trades hit the gateway. Not just the, order, the time that the order was executed by the matching engine, but the time it hit the gateway. So you don't have to assume anything between the gateway to trading, actual matching engine uh, trading time. So that's very nice. One little uh, area of uncertainty removed. So those are the data you have. Now, OK, sorry, equations. Um, so this is actually super simple. The first equation here we want to ask the question, where did it come from? We know it's from K Street. We believe it's from K Street, but can we actually see it in the data? So for that, you have to transform uh, transport time into distances. So you have to assume a means of transport. And of course, the only and the, the real means of transport on land is microwaves. 
every competitive route in a country that will allow microwaves to be built is microwave today. And microwave is now completely mainstream. And by the way, it's a tip. If you're in a co-location and you care about latency and you're not receiving microwave data or you don't have a microwave connection, you should think about rethinking your strategy. But how good are those microwave networks? So they're as good as the money that you can actually make by using them. And the news trade is a, is a trade that is actually bringing quite a bit of money in, in, uh, for the firms that can trade that. So they have invested heavily in it, and it's very much a winner-takes-all strategy. So the uh, competition, the level of competition there is very high. So you can almost assume a speed of light. It's not quite speed of light because there are like, little things that you can't get away with, like repeating the signal, and, and there are small cables in the way. So the first equation essentially says that it's speed of light, that's the little c here. D is distance, and it's also multiplied by a fudge factor. When you don't know exactly what's going on, you put a fudge factor, and that's the epsilon guy, and the fudge factor is a correction for the speed of light. And what we took in this analysis is a half a percent correction uh, of the speed of light. So this says that we're assuming the micro networks are close to the speed of light to half a percent. Plus, there's a little bit of thing going on in the endpoint. You need to use a fiber to, to get to the trading engine. So we're adding a few microseconds. I think we took 15 microseconds. And by the way, if you're interested in the precise analysis, come by the booth, leave your business card. We have a full paper with you know, uh, all the uh, numbers and all the crunching and all the convincing that needs to be done. And you will be able to proofread it and, and be convinced by yourself. So the second thing we need to do is, remember, we know T0 exists, but we don't know what T0 is. So what we really should do is we should remove T0. So for that, you just say that the time of arrival in Aurora is T0 plus something, the transport time, the time of arrival in Cartwright is T0 plus something, and you subtract those two equations. Boom, T0 goes away. So you're left only with quantities that you can kind of estimate. So the distance of the place where the news was released to Aurora minus the distance where the place was uh, released to Cartwright is actually given by this equation. And we have very few unknown parameters. There's the fudge factor of 0.5%. It doesn't change very much. And then we have to make an assumption of what the difference is between that T1 and the T3. We measure T3, but we like to know T1. Uh, for that, the tick to trade of five mics, we ignore it. It's the same firms doing the same business in Chicago and in NASDAQ. They have the same number for the tick to trade. That also goes away from the equation. So we're just left with the time it takes for the CME matching engine to match an order, and the time it takes for the NASDAQ matching engine to match an order. And if you look at what CME and NASDAQ publish, uh, CME is quite a bit slower than NASDAQ, and we'll actually measure how much slower it is. So that's fun. You can actually measure that. So if you look at, if you plot all the points that satisfy this equation, you actually, and come with slightly different values of tau, you have the red lines here. And what is absolutely beautiful is that with no, like almost no adjustable parameters, you actually see that the red line actually goes through Washington. So this is perfectly consistent with the hypothesis of saying news was released in Washington, DC. So if you zoom a little bit in this, you will see that uh, the K Street data center, and, and if you actually go on, on Bing or on Google Earth, you can actually zoom on the thing, and you can see antennas on the top of the building. 
from where the microwave networks start. So you zoom and you see that uh, the difference between any two lines is five microseconds on the um, gateway to matching time on uh, the CME matching engine minus the NASDAQ matching engine. And based on that, if the other things have no uncertainty to them, we can determine that that trade was matched uh, 120, 125 microseconds slower on the CME than on NASDAQ. And that's a very precise statement that you can make with very little data. So now, now that we've done this, uh, we can actually do another thing. We can actually back out what T0 is because we know what the transport time is. And like, I don't want to bore you with the, uh, the equation itself, but please remember the number on the right. So it's one second, 304 millisecond, and 741 microsecond after the theoretical release time. And there's a give or take of maybe 10 microseconds. It's hard to estimate exactly what my error bars are, but the error bars are small. They're much smaller than 100 microsecond. All right, so now we have T0. So now I can go about and try and find what is the optimal transport time to Eurex, because I have the uh, arrival time in Eurex. So how do I do that? So it's very simple. I take the T0 and I go to Google Earth and I draw you know, very straight lines. I measure, and of course I, I can't assume that it's gonna go over a large body of water, so I have to make them not perfectly straight. So I make them as straight as I can without crossing too much water. Simple rule. Um, I measure those. I use my little equation with my fudge factor of half a percent, and I find a transport time between K Street and Brookhaven, where the best uh, undersea cable was starting at the time. That was Feb of this year. Then I have to add the transport time on the undersea cable, and there I hit a snag. So I have 58.2 here, um, millisecond round trip, but that's a hard number to actually measure. And the reason is that the industry of telecom is not very transparent about latencies. All right, so if you do a little digging, you can actually find presentations where this number is given. It's really hard. You have to dig real well. But there are some places where at some point someone has told what it was. And uh, in the paper that we have, we give those references. So the number here, the magic number is 58.2 round trip. And that goes from Brookhaven to White Sands Bay in Cornwall in the UK. So you add 58.2 divided by two. And then you do the same trick on the other side. You go from White Sands to Eurex and you assume a very straight path. Like maybe there I was a little optimistic, maybe I should have bent it a bit, because I'm going over a, a fairly large body of water at the beginning. But you know, those guys are, are super good, and the microwave guys in general, us included, are pretty good. So I do that, I use the same formula again, and then I find a, a number. And that's the number which really, if things are close to perfect on the microwave lines, that's what you get. You would have gotten a uh, signal arriving at Eurex at that time. So do you remember the number on the right? Uh, uh, you know, the last number in the equation? Probably not. Uh, but if I put it here for you, then you can see that uh, the number of the time it reaches Eurex is actually consistent with extremely good microwave lines. And that sort of validates uh, many things. It validates the assumptions we make for how good the microwave lines are. So the simple stupid formula is actually very precise. 
uh, it's only precise for very competitive routes, you know. But uh, when a route is very competitive, it's very precise. And it also rules out another thing. When I embarked on this, I was thinking to myself, like, there are other means of propagation. Someone could use HF radio. And HF radio is essentially doing what Marconi did more than a century ago. And that obviously works. So we're not 100% sure it's legal. Like, we don't really know. But it, it, you know, physically, it's got to work. And if it worked, it would be faster than this. So it kind of rules out HF radio. It doesn't completely rule out HF radio, but it kind of rules out HF radio. So I think based on that, we've been able to essentially validate a simple formula for good microwave networks. We've been able to see that the means of transport is microwave networks. Um, we've done a, a surprising number of things with essentially trade data. And you know that, that is actually that's surprising to me. And that is a surprise that I would like to share with you. And that is a surprise that I think can tell us a lot about the way we should regulate markets. Because the issue is the analysis that I've done here is simple, but it's not accessible to everyone. It's not accessible to everyone because you have to be in the colos, you have to record the data, you have to have UTC, perfect timestamp, PTP synchronized, all of these things to support uh, the infrastructure that will gather the data. You know, I can't venture an exact guess, but a low number is $100,000 a month. So just to look and do this analysis, it's a little expensive. So what we believe is that trade data should be made public with perfect timestamps. And we have a paper on this. We believe it would fix tons of other issues. It would fix actually um, best execution obligations, it would fix tons of things in the regulatory framework just by freeing the data, making it open, and letting it uh, be perused by anyone. And it would, most importantly, bring back a lot of confidence to the markets. So that's the thing, one of the things that I would like to leave you with. Um, open data is good.